So, Nicola, mm. um, if you could maybe just give us a sense of what it's like to be a mother, um, a teacher, and the dean of one of the most prestigious business schools um, in the country, if not on the continent. How do you balance those responsibilities? Let's start off by saying it's busy. You know, you choose the job that needs to be done now. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have done this job 15 years ago in the same right. way that I can do it now. Right. And I've got fantastic support from my husband. I'm very, very lucky in terms of that. So I'm hearing that there's a lot of learning that you've had to, you know, encounter as you grew into this role. But it's life. You know, I, I think part of it is you, you've got to reassess. Your circumstances change. You know, it's like running, running a business, our circumstances, fees must fall. Mm -hmm. It's different. We've suddenly got to be looking for budgets. And so we owe it to ourselves not only to think about our business's strategies, but we've also got to think about, in terms of my life, what is required, what are my goals, what's required for me to succeed mm -hmm. in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And what it takes now to get this right is going to be very different to what the priorities might be, right. you know, in a, in a few years' time. Right. I've been with the school since it started and I was privileged to follow on from an extraordinary leader. Our founding dean, Nick Benadell, did a remarkable job in setting up the school. And when I had the interviews with council, and you go through a very rigorous process to be appointed a dean, uh, one of the council members said to me, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I've really taken that to heart because the, the school was thriving. And I think when you come in as a leader, you've typically got two roles. The one is to a turnaround situation. You come in, you make changes very, very quickly. In a second situation, it's about really taking it from good to even better. And I face that. So I didn't come in with a huge number of changes. What I did do though, was I came in and I said to people, first of all, I don't want to make the assumption that because I've been here for so long, I know where you're at. So I set up meetings with everybody in the school, um, small group, some one-on-one, -on -one, and said, if you were the new dean, what changes would you make? And listened, and just listened some more. And, and people were remarkably open. Uh, the second thing I said was, I'm not the old dean. I can only be the best me. I've got different strengths. I haven't been dean of a school for 25 years because prior to that he was dean at another school. Um, but what I have got is I've got passion, I've got enthusiasm, and I know the right questions to ask. So I think some of it is, is signaling that although you might not come in and make massive changes immediately, you have to be the leader that, that you were designed to be. You can't be somebody else's leadership style. My style is, is perhaps relative to my predecessor, a little less formal. I think, I, you know, it's a, it's a stature issue. I probably don't move as fast. I tend to be a little more consultative. And so it was sending a message early on that says, this is who I am and this is how I can play authentically. Women leaders are associated with being more consultative with sometimes taking longer to make decisions. I would probably fit in some of those, but I think to say that there's a stereotype of a female leader is stereotypical in itself. And we've got to be careful of that, you know? In some ways, if I think about my, my family dynamics at home, I'm not your average mum. My husband's actually the more nurturing one than I am. I'm as tough as nails. So, you know, I, th I think it's been informed by being female, and I think we, we learn to grow up perhaps listening a little more that's at play, but it's not all about because I'm a woman. I want you to maybe give us a sense of what you make of the current corporate landscape in South Africa. Where do you think our policy goes wrong in terms of keeping um, young, innovative corporate minds in the country when they've got their qualifications? I think that there are phenomenal opportunities in South Africa, mm -hmm. but we often have this, uh, this tendency to to complain. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency, the moment something goes slightly negative, the sports team doesn't perform, we go, this is absolutely dreadful. When I look at the corporate landscape though, companies have to change. So I think that one of the greatest um, uh, abilities that an organization or an individual needs to survive right now is, and thrive, it's not just about survival, it's about thriving, is they've got to be resilient, they've got to be able to handle change. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no plain sailing, there's no company that is going to be able to sit here and say what I did last year is going to fit perfectly what's needed next year. Mm -hmm. So part of that challenge is to calibrate, is to be agile, is to take stock and recognize where the opportunities are. And the companies that are big and the companies that are slow, well, somebody else is going to get their lunch. 
It's the same for individuals. Mm -hmm. But I think people underestimate the phenomenal opportunities that are present in this country.